I don't know about you, but there are just some days where I just feel like saying it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? It is, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. That, now, now, I'm going to hang on a second. Hang on a second. Let's do that. Let's do that just one more time. Okay? I know the kids were probably distracting you. Okay? There might have been different things, but it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's a little better. This side, y'all are still sleeping over here. Which is interesting because y'all are closest to the coffee, but that's all right. Uh, we're going to be in the book of John. Um, we started the book of John a few weeks ago, um, and uh, you're, you're probably going to, you probably should get used to hearing that. Um, we're going to be in the book of John for the next eight or nine years, I think. Um, no, I'm just kidding. We're going verse by verse through the book of John, though, and today is an exciting day because we're going to look at uh, one of the first miracles, or the first miracle of Jesus. And so we're going to kind of unpack miracles um, today. We're going to talk about those in just a, in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, before we get started, I also wanted to tell you the Thailand team. We've got six people in Thailand. They have made it. Um, they've made it and they are, they're safe. They're getting ready for um, the outreach, I believe, to start tomorrow. Um, I think it's I think it's still Sunday there, but I think it's late. Um, I woke up to a message this morning that they had attended church like hours before. So um, so they're there. Um, they are they are they are uh, enjoying themselves and uh, getting excited to fit some wheelchairs. So we, for those of you who don't know, we've got a team in Thailand right now on a Wheels for the World outreach, taking uh, refurbished wheelchairs and fitting folks with disability. Uh, with a wheelchair for some cases for the first time, uh, which is a, an incredible experience. I've gotten to do it a few times down in the Dominican Republic. It's awesome. And we got six folks there that have endured, I think, 22 hours in the air. And, uh, and they're, I'm sure they're all adjusted, all caught up from jet lag and ready to go. Um, John chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1. I want to read it first uh, this morning, and then we'll unpack this in a couple of different ways today. Sound good? All right, <laughs> this is going to be fun. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, who was the mother of Jesus? Mary. Mary. Awesome pop quiz there. I like it. Verse 2, Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Sometimes we need to be pushed to do the right thing, don't we? Jesus was not quite ready. He had called his first disciples but, but we're going to unpack this a little bit more in just a few moments. Jesus is at this wedding, not as many, many, many of us know Jesus, right? Jesus was at this wedding as a family friend, right? I mean, I mean, mind you, it was 30 years. He's 30 years old at this point before he began his public ministry. And so Jesus didn't just hide out in the house for those 30 years. He was a carpenter. He was, he, was, he was active. He was moving. He was in the temple we see at 13. He was doing all of these things. And so he was invited to this wedding, not as this miracle worker, amazing rabbi teacher. He was invited to this wedding as a family friend. And it's important to remember that when we see what happens. And so Jesus is just over there waiting for cake. Right? I mean, Jesus, I mean, let's be honest, right? Once the ceremony happens, that's what we're all waiting for. I heard an amen right over here. Hallelujah. Right? Don't ever. Anyway, okay. Don't, never mind. All right. Um, I, think I've wet, I think I've left one, maybe two weddings before cake. And those, those are just hard. Anyway. Um, and so he's just sitting over there as a family friend, waiting, you know, enjoying the wedding, enjoying the festivities. And weddings in this time would go for days, right? They would go for days. Um, if you've ever planned a wedding or executed a wedding, can you imagine a wedding that just went for days? I know yours felt like it probably went for days, and it, and it didn't. Um, but, but, but this celebration would go uh, for, for a significant amount of time. And Jesus is just sitting over there, and then Mary comes over to Jesus and says, Hey, son. 
They're out of wine. They're out of wine. Whoa, keep it playing. <laughs> they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, and we're going to get to that too, because that's not a degrading term. Okay, It's not a degrading term. And this time, that would have been uh, endearing, respectful, honoring. Right, Woman, uh, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. We see at this point, right? We see at this point, Jesus, John the Baptist, who's prepared the way, and he's called like six disciples at this point, right? Not, not many other people know what Jesus is about to embark on, right? And so Jesus is like, now, now's not the time. Now's not the time for me to un, uh, you know, unveil and all of those things. And his mother looked at the servants because his, you know, Hmm. Sometimes we need to be, like I said earlier, pushed to do the right thing, right? She looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Then we see in verse 6, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 Gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now it had become wine. And did not know where it came from. If you've got your Bible open in front of you, underline that. Did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then they they get out the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Remember, that's the theme of John, believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Now, the biggest reason that I think a lot of people get excited when we talk about Jesus' first miracle here is turning water into wine, right? Is pastor? I don't know what that is, but it just felt like the right thing to do in that moment. Pastor, right, is drinking bad. Right? That's people people hear this message, water into wine, and they think, wow, what are we gonna do with this? What are we gonna do with alcohol? Well, I don't want to disappoint you, right? Because I like you. Most of you. Um, right? I don't want to disappoint you, right? But that has nothing to do with what this passage is about. Like, that has nothing to do with what this passage is about. What this passage has to do with is the greatness of who Jesus is and the fact that he's beginning his ministry here. Now, what we do know, because some people have tried to dismiss this, some scholars and some some people have tried to dismiss this, right? It wasn't real wine. Wrong. Right? Wrong. I mean, the master of the feast comes running out uh, and, and says um, to the groom and, and, and all of that, right? Most people save, right? They use the good wine first and they save the poor wine for when people drink too much. And they don't, they're not going to notice. They're not going to care. Right? But you haven't done that. You've saved the good stuff. Get it? The good stuff for now. Right? You've saved the good stuff for now. We see Jesus kind of wear three hats in this story. The first hat that we see Jesus wear is Jesus as the guest. Okay? Jesus is the guest. Again, 
I mentioned to you, right? Jesus isn't coming here as this great teacher, this great rabbi, all of those things. He's coming as a guest. Jesus and his disciples, six disciples at the time, uh, they're invited to a wedding. Jesus' mother, Mary, seems to be involved in the wedding in somehow, in some way, shape, or form. So it may be that of a family member or a family friend, but we don't know for sure. But they arrive, and then something unthinkable happens in this time. The host runs out of wine. Running out of wine at an event like this in in time was a big deal, right? It would be like hosting a trunk or treat and running out of candy. Which isn't going to happen tonight, right? 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 But why do people come to a trunk or treat? Candy, right? They don't come to see your trunk. Sorry to bust that bubble. They come to get candy from your trunk, okay? All right? And so, similar thing, right? This would have been a big deal. Running out of wine at an event like this would have been a big deal. And it's the groom's responsibility to provide fitting hospitality to all of the guests. Did you hear that? It's the groom's responsibility in this time to provide fitting hospitality, which would have included wine, to all of the guests. And so, to run out of wine was insulting to everyone who was there. Not just unfortunate, but insulting to everyone who's there. No one can run to the grocery store at this time and pick up some more. Like we'll do tonight if we run out of candy. Right? They're stuck and they're just out of luck. Right? But again, don't miss the fact Jesus is represented here Firstly, as a guest. And then we see him in verses 3 through 5. Look at verses 3 through 5 again. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Not only do we see Jesus as a guest, but we see Jesus as the Son. Mary goes over to Jesus, filling him in on the situation. They don't have any wine. Now, what Mary's not doing is she's not sharing the latest dirt on the groom. Right? She's, not trying to, she's not trying to share the latest gossip. Can you believe it? They've run out of wine. They've run out of wine. Can you believe it? How stupid. Right? This is not her temperament. This is not what she's doing. She's telling him. Why? Because she wants him to do something about it. She knows. She remembers the miraculous birth of Jesus, she remembers the promise that he was the Son of God, that he was the Savior of the world, and so he had the capability to do something about the situation, and that's why Mary goes and involves Jesus into the situation as her son. Hey, they've run out of wine. You need to do something about this. And look at his response. Again, woman, what does this have to do with me. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, this is not disrespectful, but can you imagine today in 2024, you're sitting at a wedding, your mama comes over to you, son, they've run out of cake. Right? And again, not sharing the latest gossip, but wanting you to run to Hanny's or Shaw's or something like that and pick up some cupcakes. Right? Imagine your response in this way. Woman, What's this got to do with me? Mom, how would that go? Okay, very good. Right? She'd get up on that ladder. No, okay. All right? It'd be disrespectful, right? But in this culture, in that culture, this title was not mean, it was not rude, and it was not disrespectful. In fact, it's the same way that Jesus addresses Mary when he's on the cross in John 19. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which I love that, John writing about himself, right? The disciple, we're going to get to that, that's that's awesome. When we get to that in like 2027, it's going to be awesome. (laughs) When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here's your son. And in that context, Jesus called Mary woman while caring for his mother. He made sure that she was going to be cared for after his death. And so we see Mary come to Jesus though the way in which we are all, through the way in which we are all to come to Jesus as someone in need of help. 
See, Mary comes to Jesus in this moment because, again, she seems to have something to do with the wedding here. And so she's trying to engage Jesus because she knows that, she, that he can help the situation. And so she comes to Jesus as someone desperately in need of help. And that is the approach, family, that we are each to take when we approach Jesus as someone desperately in need of help. So let me ask you this morning, what do you need help with? Just, uh, okay, just think about it. I was just going to say, just think about it, right? Do you need help in your marriage? Do you need help in your job? Do you need help with your kids? You, like, what, where is it that you, and are you, approaching to G, are you approaching Jesus this morning? Because this miracle, this passage is all about expectation of Jesus. Mary has an expectation of Jesus as someone who is desperately in need of help and just happens to be someone she's raised. Isn't that beautiful? And in the same way, this is how each of us are to approach Jesus. But look at Jesus' question again. Why do you involve me? Why do you involve me? Now this is important. Because again, it's, it's another reminder that Jesus did not come to earth to do what man wanted. More wine. It's not what Jesus wanted to involve himself with. Jesus did not come to this earth to do what man wanted. Throughout the Gospel of John, and we're going to see this over and over and over again, Jesus demonstrates a single-minded focus on one thing, to accomplish his Father's will. To accomplish his Father's will. So he didn't come to obey mankind, but God. And so he tells Mary that his time has not yet come, but she is expectant. And she looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Do whatever he tells you to do. She's confident that Jesus could and would do something. And so she demonstrated faith here. She could, she, a willingness to leave it in his hands, confident in whatever he said and did was best. And guess what? She was right. Sounds like a mother, doesn't it? Six large stone water jars each uh, holding between 20 and 30 gallons to the brim went in as water and came out as wine. So we see Jesus as the guest, we see Jesus as the son, and then lastly, Jesus changes and shifts gears in verses 6 when he starts this process. Now these purification jars, they were around, right? They were around because it was important in this time, right? Because Jesus came to, uh, uh, to fulfill the Old Testament requirements, right? But back then, in any time they were to approach holiness or holy time, they would have had to go through ceremonial cleansings and washings and all of those things. And that's what these jars were used for, cleansing. And this is what we're going to drink out of now. Anybody else got germ issues? That you okay, right? And so Jesus transitions to the host. Verse seven: Jesus said to the servants, "Fill the jars with water." They filled them up. He said to them, "Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast." And so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water had now become wine and didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. And so Jesus provided, became the host. Now, why does this account of the story give the purpose of the water jars? Because it's impressive. It's more impressive to turn water into wine if it's jars used for, for, for purification. The inclusion of this detail shows us that the rituals associated, get this, get this, get this, okay? The rituals associated with the old covenant, again, cleansing, are giving way for something far greater. You see that? 
So these rituals for the old covenant that they had to do if they wanted to encounter God are now giving way for something far greater. Now that Jesus was here, things have changed. The water of ceremony is being replaced with something far better. External purification has given way to internal cleansing. I love that. External purification now giving way to internal cleansing. And so the servants take the wine to the head waiter and he's startled. See, because apparently, and again, we've already talked about this, the tradition was to use the best wine first, but the wine that Jesus creates is far superior to what they had before. Even the quality of the wine testifies to the extraordinary nature of what Jesus did. And it's so good that those who know what happened can draw no other conclusion then that is miraculous. No other conclusion. It says the servants knew. Right? They knew exactly what had happened. Because all they did was go fill them with water. And then Jesus is like, draw some out. Take it. Test it. Taste it. See that it is good. Right? And so, and so there was no other explanation except Jesus had done something miraculous here. Now this shows us two things that I want us to hear about. Okay, so we see Jesus is the guest, Jesus is the son, then Jesus is the host. Right, he kind of transitions here in these 12 verses in this passage. Two things that are really big here that I don't want you to miss. Number one, pretty obvious, Jesus has the power to transform water into wine. Pretty awesome. Pretty powerful. Right, Jesus has the, the power to transform water into wine. Why? Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is powerful. Some of y'all aren't convinced, but that's all right. Okay. Now, this is important because we see that Jesus can do miraculous things, which means there's something different about Jesus. Okay? There's something different about Jesus. Right? You got a water bottle? Turn it into wine. That's a Yeti. It might work. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's why they're so expensive. No. Um, but even if I don't understand everything about him, don't raise your hands, but anybody in here in that boat? Right? Don't necessarily understand everything about Jesus. Even if I don't understand everything about Jesus, I can know that he's different because he can do things no one else can. And here we see that Jesus has the power to transform water into wine. And so what are we going to do with this story of Jesus transforming water into wine? We've got two choices. Number one, we can say it's not true. And in saying it's not true, we can say that the Bible can't be trusted. Stories of fairy tale and all who believe it are foolish. People try to dismiss these things all of the time, yet... It's been historically proven. So, that choice can't be logical. Choice number two. Realize and embrace. Realize and embrace. This morning. And so if you're a skeptic in the room, awesome. But with a story like this, we have to realize and embrace the uniqueness of Jesus. The fact he can do things and has, has a power that no one else does. That no one else can. And so we can realize and embrace the uniqueness of Jesus. He did something miraculous here. How can he do it? Well, the Bible says he can do it because he's the creator. That's what we talked about in, in, in chapter 1. That he was in the beginning. He was with God. He was God. And then he saw the need. And so Jesus sent him to put skin on Number two, not only does Jesus have the power to transform water into wine, but Jesus has the power to transform people's lives. Look at verse 11. I want you to see verse 11. We're going to concentrate on verse 11, then I'm going to give you three takeaways, all right? All right? Okay, all right. This side of the room is just still... Verse 11, look at this. This... The first, everybody say first. This, the first of his signs, 
Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, there's three words I want to point out to you here. The story ends with kind of this editorial comment by John, the disciple in whom Jesus loved. He, no, he never tells his name. He never says, I, John. He says, I, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? He would have gotten picked on big time in youth group. I'm just saying. Right? Oh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? But he ends kind of with an editorial comment, and he puts, points out three words, okay? The first of his signs, everybody say signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, say glory. And his disciples believed in him, say believed. These three words are big when it comes to this story. Because again, remember, back at the beginning of the story, Jesus wasn't ready. He's saying, woman, my time's not yet come. What do you want me to do about this? What does this have to do with me? And and Mary doesn't even respond. She doesn't even give time to that. She just leaves with, hey, I've placed, I came to Jesus with a situation. I came to Jesus with a problem. And an expectation and a faith that he was going to do something about it. And so looks at the servants and says, "Do, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Right? I mean, don't miss that. Don't miss the faith of Mary here. Right? But then John, at the end of this, talks about these three words. Signs, glory, believed. Let's talk about these three words for just a minute. A guy by the name of D.A. Carson says this about signs. John prefers the simple word signs. Jesus' miracles are never simply naked displays of power, still less neat conjuring tricks to impress the masses, but signs, significant displays of power that point beyond themselves to the deeper realities that could be perceived with the eyes of faith. Can I tell you something? Again, a lot of people get excited about this story. But the the truth I believe that we miss in this story often is this is a prayer message. This is a prayer message. Because I don't believe we pray in faith like Mary does here. Uh, think about it for a second. How do we pray today? Right? God, I've, I've got this need. I hate asking. I don't want to bug you. God of the universe. you got all these people, right? There's so many people that are worse off than me. But, and, so, and so if you've got time, if you've got time, would you just maybe look at this situation? And, and, and how, how about do this, this, and this? Like I've already done the analyzing. I've already, I've already weighed it out. I've looked at all the, 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 the numbers on this. I've crunched them all. This is the best solution. And so if you've got time, if, if, you, if you just could, because uh, you're, you're, you know, you're all powerful, you're all knowing, maybe you could meet this need. As opposed to, God, this situation is broken and I need you to do something about it. And walk away with an expectancy that something beyond your wildest dreams would would happen. And the extraordinary thing to me and listen, this happens to me all the time. This happens to me all the time. Okay, I've not perfected this. I'm not standing up here as a preacher this morning saying, I know better than you. I'm living better than you. No, because I, I do this all of the time, right? The, 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 the extraordinary thing to me when it comes to our prayer lives is somehow, some way, we forget the track record of God in our own lives. Like, like, like this morning, this morning, who else on a Sunday morning in October when it's 31 degrees out 
just wants to drive to Sanford to watch the first half of their nine-year-old's football game and freeze to then come to church. Anybody else? Like, I just, that's incredible. It was an incredible moment this morning. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you the God moment this morning. I'm driving up 202, and I don't always, I don't always come up this way. Right? I, don't come, I, know, I know some of you, this is the way you come up to church. And so you're over here in front of Moody's, and you come up, and then you just glance over, and you see the backside of the building, right? all of that. I don't, I don't drive that way very often. But this morning, as I was driving up 202 and, and saw kind of the sun reflecting off the building perfectly and the sign on the back of the building and thinking to myself, two and a half years ago, this was trees. This was trees. This was, this was trees. Like if you still look at Google Maps or whatever, you can still see a bunch of trees here with just a blue dot that says there's something here now. Right? And there's like an old racetrack that used to be like right, right here. Like we would be, I think I'd be in like turn two right now. Like we, we'd be in turn two. Y'all over there would be like, anyway, you get the point. Right? God did this. Before that, right, and some of you know the story, some of you don't, God sold two church buildings, not to condominiums, not to, uh, 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 what's, the, what's the correct term, cannabis store, whatever, right? Not to, not, to, not to those things, but to two other gospel-preaching, gospel-proclaiming churches in the state of Maine. That's incredible, Right? Like, like, I don't know about you, but there's so many days. That's just a couple things, right? And that's corporate. That's not even personal. Like, like I prayed when both of my kids were born. Or, ooh, both. Four. <laughs> All four kids. We had two sets of two, kind of two close together. When both sets of my kids were born. 20 and 21 months apart. When all four, kids, when all four of my kids were born, I was like, God, save them. Right, God, save them. I know it's going to be hard, like all the pastors' kids stuff and all that. Like they're going to grow up with all kinds of trauma and baggage because people are going to mistreat them and not treat them as humans, but as pastors' kids and all these different things. They're going to have different expectations over their lives than any other kids do, and all those different things. But God, save them from that. Protect them. May they meet you. I've baptized all four of my kids. Isn't that incredible. So now they're perfect. Right? You get the point, right? We forget so quickly the track record of God and how He's done it over and 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 over. Again, there's not enough overs. Because before you, if you're in a gospel trusting, gospel believing family, I guarantee you, you have a conversation with your mama and daddy. He did it for them. Grandma and grandpa, he did it for them. We could fill months and months if we're truly honest with ourselves about how we've seen God miraculously show up and do things beyond our power, control, and authority over and over again in our lives. Yet why is he the last resort so often? If that's the track record, if that's the track record, y'all done got me off track. Signs, right? Then we see the glory, right? I'm going to come back to that in just a few minutes, okay? The glory, the glory of Jesus is made visible in this act. What once was water, now wine. Now, Glory can sometimes be a misunderstood word. Glory just means greatness. Like, and, and, not, and, and, and don't let me cheapen it, right, with just saying greatness. The greatest greatness ever. The greatest greatness ever. Like, that's, the, that's glory for dummies, okay? Like, that's, like that, the greatest greatness ever is, is, would be the Travis definition of glory, okay? I don't want to credit anybody else with that, because I think it's a good definition. But we see the glory here because, again, there's a sign beyond anyone's power, beyond anyone's authority, beyond anyone's control that is done here in this text. And it does nothing else but to point 
people to the fact that some, someone greater with more glory is at work here. And his disciples, the servants, saw a divine power on display. And the result of that, they believed. Now, the point of this count, the point of this account, the point of water into wine, is not that Jesus can meet needs and do cool tricks at weddings. We've already talked about that. Right? Mary comes to him as a sinner in need of help. As someone in need of help. Help. The disciples see the glory of the Lord. There's a sign here, right? The point is that Jesus is uniquely the Son of God here to do God's work. And we need to believe Him. And we need to trust Him. And we need to trust Him. So I believe there's three takeaways here from this text, and they come right from the text. And the first takeaway I want to give you is this. Do whatever He tells you. Do whatever he tells you. And so again, let's go back to prayer. Because in order to do whatever he tells you, what needs to happen? You gotta hear his voice. You gotta hear his voice. In order to do whatever he tells you, you gotta hear his voice. Now, this implies, does it not, a total surrender, complete obedience to Jesus. In order for me to do whatever he tells me, i got to hear him. i got to listen to him. i got to set time out and aside to pray. Anybody else like me? And sometimes the volume of life is just way too loud to even hear the voice of Jesus. Turn the volume down. Turn the volume down. Turn the volume down. And say, God, today, I want to hear your voice. Today, I want to hear your voice. Today, I want to make room for you to speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Number two, not only do whatever he tells you, number two, they filled them up to the brim. Jesus looks at a servant and says, take those jars right there, go fill them with water. He just says with water. He doesn't say to fill them up to the brim. I don't know if this is kind of a test, for the servants or what, but they filled them, they filled them up to the brim. I see it as they were expecting. I just don't want I, I, they were expecting. I don't want you to just fill halfway, right? I want the whole thing. I want the whole thing. I want overflowing. They were expectant, right? They put in the full amount of effort that they could provide in expectancy for Jesus to move. A guy by the name of Dallas Willard said this, grace is not opposed to effort. It is, the, it is, it is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. And so where, where many of us miss it, or where many of us don't fill to the brim in our connection in our life with Jesus, is we go to Jesus and we say, hey, I need you to provide food for my family. And we just sit there. And we wait. There's a story of two farmers, right? They're both promised rain. One goes out and prepares his fields for rain. The other sits on the couch and waits for rain. See, sometimes filling them up to the brim, right, means we don't just sit and we pray that God would put food on our table, but we go out and we have conversation. We ask. We get vulnerable with people. We tell people where we are. I was watching 
I was watching a church service this past week where this guy that had no food, no home, walks in off the street, sits on the front row. The pastor just so happened to be preaching about the Good Samaritan that day. and It's almost like God's in control. This guy's sitting on the front row and he couldn't help but notice. And so at one point in his message, like preachers do sometimes, right? They make over-encompassing statements, right? Like we've all tasted sweet tea, right? No, I'm just, you know. And so he said, he said, none of us, none of us probably know what it's like to be laying in a ditch with no food, no, nothing. And this guy on the front row says, I did, I do. And the pastor couldn't avoid it at that point because the guy shouted it out in front of everybody. What makes the message even better is he shouted out a cuss word with it. Awesome. Church service. Because now, what do you do with that? The pastor has him come up, tell the story of how he got there that morning. This church has like three services. And so a guy had gone to the 8 o'clock service and went and saw this guy. And anyway, he ended up there. While the pastor is telling this story, people are just walking down the front and just dumping wallets out on the stage to give this guy. It just is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the, pa- and the pastor, you can just completely tell that he is all lost, thrown off. His message at this point is out the window. Right? Because they got something tangible right in front of him. I believe wholeheartedly that the number one thing standing in the way between us and experiencing miracle after miracle after miracle of God in our lives is pride. Because even though we're family and we're going to spend eternity with the people in our row, we can't ever let them know what's really going on in our lives. And until you get real with the family and God and like Mary come to Jesus and say, hey, there's a problem here. There's a problem here. And I need you to fix it. Do whatever he tells you. Until we see that total surrender and we fill our jars to the brim. There will always be a barrier between us and God when it comes to experiencing miracles. They filled them to the brim. And then lastly, lastly, they didn't know where it came from. Didn't know where it came from. Look at verse 9. It says there, When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from. Did not know where it came from. So, from chapters 2 to 11, and this is, this is kind of the transition, right? We're, we're, we're transitioning out of the introduction of Jesus in the book of John to now his public ministry. From chapters 2 to 11, we see Jesus performing miracle after miracle, sign after sign. And so, this morning, just in the, in the last couple minutes, in the last couple minutes, it's important to define what a miracle is before we continue. And we've kind of kind of been hitting, we've kind of been dancing with it all morning. Okay, now it's just time to come out with it, right? And a, a miracle, according to the Lexham Bible Dictionary, it's a big book. That sounds smart there. Okay. Defines miracle as this, an, ev- an event that defies common expectations of behavior and subsequently is attributed to a superhuman agent. Okay? An occurrence that demonstrates God's involvement in the course of human affairs. That's the definition of miracle. 
right? according to the Lexham Bible Dictionary. So an event that defies common expectations of behavior and subsequently is attributed right, to a superhuman agent, an occurrence that demonstrates God's involvement in the course of human affairs. In short, a miracle is an event that defies common expectations and demonstrates God's involvement in our lives. And here's the thing. Right? Because we've kind of mystified this word miracle. That's for certain denominations. That's for certain type of churches. All of those things. And in, and, in, and in doing that, we're missing out on the power of God as His people. Okay? We're missing out on the power of God as His people. Okay? God wants to do miracles in your lives. But you've got to understand, the miracle that He may do in your life is not the one that you expected. Okay, He got bored with my sermon, and so he's, he's probably out in the lobby at this point. But this guy over here in the wheelchair, that's my brother. Okay, He just turned 51, and I know some of you have heard this story over and over and over again, and, and I really hesitate. I've, I've been battling with God all week on whether or not to go here. But there was even one time where we took my brother, I was about 11 years old, we took my brother to this TV studio to see this TV preacher that was, that was healing people and people were walking and people were miraculous being healed and all that stuff. You know what happened? They asked us to leave. You know why? Because my brother's wheelchair was in the aisle where the TV guy was going to be walking out and so he was in the way. As an 11 year old, Going home, you know the impression that that left me with? Well, if you just heal him, like you do on TV all the time, wheelchair wouldn't be in the way. I got a chair right next to me. We'll hang out or we'll just leave and like go to my dad's work and let Andy just walk in. Blow everybody away. The miracle that I prayed for, for 20 years, plus years of my life was that Andy would walk and talk. Although I was kind of nervous about the talking piece because Andy knows me better than anybody else. He's seen some things and he's the oldest brother and I was worried he might sell me out sometimes. All right. That was not the miracle that God wanted to do in the Bush family was make Andy walk. The miracle that God wanted to do in the Bush family was to change our perspective that God could use the guy in the wheelchair to transform people's lives. And so, and so God has a plan for a wheelchair. Right? The miracle that God has done in this service happened way before the preaching ever started. Right? That we had a guy up here that, that, that is actually playing the guitar the right way. Like, I think, I think Nick needs to teach you how to play the guitar the right way. Okay, you're playing it wrong doing it this way. Okay, Nick's got it right. Okay, you've got you to learn. Okay, right? But we got a guy up here that, that, that rarely shares a stage with anybody. He led you in worship this morning. That's a miracle. Right? I, I, I'm sure, right, from time to time, people have prayed in these families, God, change my situation, change my circumstance. I want my daughter to have friends to go to homecoming with. I want my son to be quote-unquote normal. No such thing, by the way. Look around you. Ain't nothing normal in this room. Right? And so sometimes... The miracle is not what you pray for. That's where, we, that's where the surrender comes in. Do whatever he tells you. Right? Because the miracle might be you pray for something for 20 plus years, but he's already worked the miracle. He's already working the miracle. And he's just got to change your perspective to see that he's using the thing that you prayed would go away. And so either God will make him walk, or God will show you that he can't walk. Because he's not through with them yet. But I submit to you, as the worship team comes this morning, I submit to you this. I submit to you this. 
is that if you would pray this prayer, God, give me eyes to see the miracle you're doing in my life today. You would see that God is working miracle after miracle after miracle in your life. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Because there's signs. There's the glory of God for those who believe in Him. For those who believe in Him. And so this morning, this morning, we're all, we're all about doing different things today, I guess. I wasn't planning on doing this, and so, whatever. But I also believe there's power in numbers. What are you praying for? What is the miracle you are praying for? What is the thing that you just want? I, 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 can, tell, I can tell you right now, i got a top five list. i got a top five list. Just my, my person, and, and, and my top five list are five names of people I'm praying for every single day that they would meet Jesus. That's my list. Why just five, Travis? Don't you love everybody? Yes! I pray for them too. I pray for everybody. But, but I've got five people that I'm intentionally praying for every day by name that they would meet, follow, and pursue Jesus with their lives. That God would break them of their pride, and that they would surrender to him, that they would come and see, that they'd taste and see that he is good, that he loves them. What's the miracle you're praying for in your life? I'm going to be down front. Brian and Judy will be down front. Tom, I don't know if you and Lois are still in the room. You might have left, but if you kind of come on this side, and if you just want somebody to pray with you for your miracle this morning, as these guys are singing, I'm going to pray in just a moment. I'll invite you to stand after I pray. As these guys start singing, if you want to come down front, ask somebody to join you in prayer for your miracle, would love to. If you don't want to come down front, there's a connection card that Dylan mentioned earlier in the service. Take that thing out on the back. There's a prayer request section. Write your miracle down. Drop it in the offering bucket on the way out. Let's start praying and expecting. Let's start, let's start doing whatever he tells us to and filling the jars to the brim of expectation of what he can do. Because the same God that turned water into wine here is the same God that we're worshiping today. You believe it? You believe it? Let's live like we believe it. Amen? God, thank you so much that you're the same. Thank you so much that as you moved in water jars, in these purification jars, which were, what, what were used for old, what were used uh, in, in an old way to meet with you and, 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 to, and to worship with you is now being transformed into a vessel because there's internal purification that can only be done by you. Now, we don't need someone to come to you on our behalf. We don't need to do any ceremonial washings on our way into here to meet you and encounter you. God, you're in the car when we leave. You're in the bedroom in that conversation. You're in the office tomorrow. You're in the classroom. You are with us. And God, because you are with us, we can expect you to do miracles. We can expect you to do things beyond our control. We can expect you to move mountains. We can, we can expect you to make the sun stand still. We can expect you to do things supernatural. Because, God, you don't operate according to the patterns of this world. And so, God, I pray that you transform us this morning. That you wake us up. That you help us to live our lives and expectation of something far greater. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We invite you to stand and sing, and as you do, if you want to come forward, we invite you to do that as well.